Canada is expecting to receive the first shipment of the AstraZeneca vaccine today, as many as 500,000 doses. Now, we don't have the exact timing yet, but of course, coverage to come on CBC News Network. That shipment will start the clock for provincial vaccination programs. The AstraZeneca vaccine expires in a month. Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, they're among the provinces already saying they won't give the shot to anyone 65 and older for now. Holding off and waiting for more data following the recommendation of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization that we've been telling you about. And again, just to introduce our guest with that discrepancy, Health Canada last week approved the AstraZeneca vaccine for anyone in Canada 18, of, 18 years of age and older. But NACI, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, said it was not for people above the age of 65, not because it's not safe, it is safe, but because there is not enough data existing at this moment for it to be able to determine efficacy. They need more study and they need more, sorry, more real world study as well. Dr. Tam yesterday saying, stay tuned. Once new information comes in, she expects there will be guidance changing. Dr. Cora Constantinescu is with us this morning. She's an infectious diseases specialist with the Vaccine Hesitancy Clinic at Alberta Children's Hospital. She's in Calgary. We've had a ton of questions for Dr. Constantinescu, so I'm going to jump right into them because uh, people have a lot of interest in your information. Here we go from Patricia Harrington, doctor, wanting to know why the idea of ignoring the manufacturer's recommendation for spacing vaccine is safe. No one seems to know how long the vaccine is good, let alone uh, one dose, let alone two. So the manufacturers have stated they're not in agreement. It may give people a false sense of security, Patricia writes, after one dose, when in fact that dose may not be effective four months later. So this is in regard to the story of BC going ahead and extending the time between first and second doses of vaccine up to now four months. Um, what do you say in answer to Patricia's question? Patricia, that's a really tough question, and many experts are torn around this. In a perfect world where we all had enough vaccine, the easy answer would, see, would be to stick with the number, the, the spacing that was there in the phase three trials, which is somewhere between three to four weeks, based on, uh, depending on what trial people um, looked at, which vaccine people looked at. However, in the face of scarcity, so not in our vaccine, now people are saying, well, is it worthwhile immunizing people with the first dose and putting a longer time between the first and the second dose and getting more of our population protected sooner, even if the protection is not as high as it would be after the second dose? And there are two things that I can tell you about that that could work for it. So one, we now have more and more data that shows that even after one dose of these vaccines, there's somewhere between 50 to maybe about 70 to 80% protection, depending on the study and the groups that people are looking at. So there is some protection after the first dose. And again, there seems to be some protection um, and also with the AstraZeneca vaccine, inadvertently, there was a delay in a subgroup of the population to a longer period between the dosing. So they went up to 12 weeks there. And in that subgroup, they actually seem, showed that the vaccine seemed to work even better. So based on some of those things, in combination with a scarcity element, some provinces and territories are having to make the decision um, that maybe we should just vaccinate with one dose first and increase the the spacing between the two doses. Um, that's again up to every vaccine and every uh, province and territory to decide. Exactly. But that's some of the information behind it. Quebec's done some study, British Columbia as well has done some study on efficacy and this is what is behind BC's decision as we learned from Dr. Bonnie Henry. A great question from Patricia to begin this round. When we talk about vaccine hesitancy, Dr. Constantinescu, one of the groups that we know has a particular degree, high degree of hesitancy is pregnant women. And a question to that effect from Claire Halloran wondering, has there been any stance, any detail on the stance for pregnant women getting the vaccine, unsure if there's been much new data? So 
some of this is ongoing. Um, it's unfortunate that pregnant women were not included in the initial trials, but there are um, some studies that are now looking at pregnant women as well. Um, here is what, uh, what I want you to think about for pregnant women. So we know that women who are pregnant are at higher risk of severity from COVID disease. They're, at higher, they're 10 times more likely to get hospitalized, end up in ICU, and there is increased death than women of the same age who are not pregnant. So we know that the disease is worse in this population. Also, when the baby is born, they're under the 12 months, so therefore they're also considered at higher risk of, the sever of severity of disease. In addition, so there's the stakes are high to protect these populations, to protect the pregnant woman and uh, potentially have some transfer of this immunity to the baby. Um, all this in consideration with the fact that the only vaccines that are contraindicating pregnant women are the live vaccines. And we know that the COVID-19 vaccines right now authorized in Canada are not live vaccines. And this has led to many bodies and experts saying that we recommend that pregnant women go ahead and be vaccinated unless they have a different contraindication such as anaphylaxis to a previous dose of the vaccine, for example. But otherwise, we recommend they go ahead and be vaccinated. A discussion to be had with a uh, a woman's doctor for sure. I thought it was interesting. One thing perhaps to add to this question is Pfizer, we know just the other day announced Dr. Constantinescu that it is going to going ahead and studying specifically vaccine for infants and for children and for pregnant and breastfeeding women. So we should have some more data on this in yeah. the not too distant future. Clara, thank you for that question. Christine Wong has a question uh, wondering why don't health ministers, public health officials, regulatory bodies discuss matters like what we're discussing today, AstraZeneca, first and second doses in private, and then make decisions or announcements in public that are more consistent and coherent. It seems to me that this is just harming overall public trust. Now, I'm not going to get you to tell me why you think they're not doing that, but I would be interested in your thoughts because you run that vaccine hesitancy clinic. What are the effects of what seem to be sometimes confusing or conflicting? conflicting messages. Yeah, so we know that inconsistency in messaging can lead to hesitancy. Um, but we also know that people are pretty smart <laughs> and they're able to, despite the initial frustration and confusion, get past that and dig deeper and learn some of the differences in the messaging and understand how that applies to them. And to some extent, I say it's up to us, those people who are kind of in the arena of vaccine hesitancy and acceptance to get out there and actually explain what's going on to people um, because I am with you. It can be confusing. It can be frustrating to see different, uh, what seems to be different recommendations. But what I was saying earlier, it's not so much in this case, the inconsistency of the message, but understanding that the roles of these bodies are different around the vaccine um, authorization and vaccine recommendations. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I challenge each and every one of you, those of you who understand this and who know and feel convinced that this is the right thing to do and get vaccinated, talk to your family and friends, because if you become a champion for this vaccine, those people in your network are going to trust you um, because they know you and they already have a previous relationship with you. So when you figure this out, which I know a lot of your callers are trying to spread that information to the people around you so we can get our communities protected. Dolly Parton doing just that. I don't know if you've seen her video this morning. <laughs> I but have. Uh, it's it fantastic. Is, it is fantastic. <laughs> We've been playing it this morning. Okay, our final question is actually sort of a, a joint effort here from a number of people all speaking. They're concerned about we're hearing about AstraZeneca, particularly in conjunction with age. So questions about people with underlying health conditions. Specifically, people who are having or have had chemotherapy, people who are immunocompromised. Should they be going ahead with this vaccine, doctor? Yeah, so um, what we know is that it doesn't seem to be a safety concern. So we're not concerned that even people whose immune systems are blunted by immunosuppressives, we're not concerned that this is going to be a safety issue. The question is, could this be an efficacy issue, whereas the vaccine is not as good in those people because their immune systems are not as robust? So what 
so right now we recommend that even people who are immunocompromised go ahead and have a vaccine for COVID-19 because some efficacy is better than than being uh, at risk of the disease. However, uh, please talk to your doctor because depending on what your condition might be, sometimes they may choose to hold off on some of the immunosuppressives if that's possible in your condition to optimize the vaccine response. So talk to your doctor about it. It's not a safety concern. And again, uh, pro some protection is better than no protection. And I know a lot of these people who've had some um, conditions that predispose them to more severe disease have worked really hard to stay free of COVID. Um, so we need to respect and validate that, and which is why we recommend they still get vaccinated. But please do it to your doctor because there might be things you can do to optimize your response. Sandra, Leah, and Adele, thank you for your questions on this common theme. And thanks for all of the questions. We're just out of a time a little bit, doctor, because some of them are on logistics, some of them are on things that are not your areas of expertise, but we'll have other experts back to answer questions uh, in the future. Can I just tell you one more message? Michael from Hamilton writing this about you. Wow. She's a clear and knowledgeable communicator. This builds credibility and trust. I am beginning to understand the dynamics of this pandemic. That's exactly what we've been trying to do by having you in. Obviously, you are accomplishing your goal and ours. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, and thanks, Michael, for making my day. <laughs> Mine too. Dr. Cora Constantinescu, an infectious diseases specialist in Calgary. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.